The text chosen for today for last judgment is our Old Testament reading from the book of the prophet Malachi, chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, where we read as follows in Jesus' name. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its wings, and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. Then you will trample down the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do these things, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. This is the word of the Lord. Dear fellow redeemed, in my personal devotions, I was reading the book of Acts, and I came to the very last chapters of that book, which describe how St. Paul found himself in the middle of a dangerous storm on board a ship that was many miles south of Italy. St. Luke writes in Acts chapter 27, and he, by the way, was an eyewitness account of this, uh, um, of this uh, storm and everything that happened. He says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Could you imagine being in that kind of a dilemma in the middle of the ocean and it was dark for days on end? In fact, the Bible says 14 days, two whole weeks, they were buffeted by the waves and the wind. And you can understand how they would despair of hope. And then there's a passage that always jumps out at me every time I read it. St. Luke writes, Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. They prayed for daylight. They longed for the day that they might be able to see where they were. They hoped that they might be able to spot land, might be able to find a safe haven in which they could park the ship to get out of the storm. Have you ever had an occasion where you prayed for daylight? Have you ever had an occasion during the night when you were hastening the dawn, maybe or hastening the dawn rather? Maybe it was a stormy night and you couldn't sleep because you were afraid of what the weather might bring. Or maybe you were in a place where you weren't comfortable, either because the accommodations were very bad or maybe you simply didn't feel safe and so you couldn't go to sleep and how you longed for daylight. Perhaps there was a time when you were ill and the darkness and the night seemed to just drag on and on. Or maybe you had an ill child, a crying infant, and how you longed for the dawn. Maybe it was a time when you were suffering from depression or grief or insomnia, and you just wanted the darkness to end. And perhaps on one of those occasions, you too prayed for daylight. You know, we as Christians find ourselves in a sin-darkened world, don't we? And we are surrounded by darkness all of the time because there is a devil and there is a sinful, unbelieving world around us and there is a sinful nature within and they try to drag us down and they try to cast doubt upon our faith and upon what God says in his word. And there are times when we... Pray for the daylight, spiritual daylight. And we may find ourselves praying the same prayer, prayer that St. John prayed right at the end of the Bible, the last verse of the book of Revelation, where he said, even so, come Lord Jesus. Yes, we long for that day when our Lord Jesus will return and his glorious light will dispel the darkness and we will be with him forever. But you see, that is our consolation, dear Christian friends. For as the prophet Malachi promises, surely the day is coming. 
a day of fiery judgment, but also a day of eternal rejoicing. Malachi, of course, was the last of the Old Testament prophets before the coming of John the Baptizer. Malachi prophesied during a time when the people of Israel, of Judea specifically, were still in captivity, but not under the Babylonians. It was the Medo-Persians who had conquered the Babylonians, and they found themselves in the Medo-Persian Empire. But the Medo-Persians were very kind to the Israelites and allowed them to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall and rebuild the city and rebuild the temple so that they could worship once again. But the people of Israel still had times when they would backslide and they were not always faithful to the Lord and they became lackadaisical about what God promised them. But there were the prophets, Zechariah, Malachi, and others who reminded them that God had made great and gracious promises to them that he would fulfill. He told them that he would send a Savior who would crush the devil's power. He told them that this servant of God would be the anointed one who would release the prisoners from their captivity who would shine upon them with his grace and mercy and that he would deliver them from sin and Satan and death. And we find part of that prophecy in the book of the prophet Malachi. Malachi prophesied to the people of Israel. And between Malachi and the coming of Christ, there were the 400 silent years, the intertestamental period, in which there was no revelation from God. And so the people had to cling to the words of that prophet, Malachi, and all of the others. And they had to wait for God to reveal his plan and to fulfill it. And he did. God sent that Savior. But before he did, the prophet Malachi would say this. He would say, surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And that day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. Now, we don't gloat in the destruction of the unbelievers. In fact, we want to reach out to them with the gospel that they may be saved. But God does tell us that the day is coming when he will judge all people. It will be a fiery judgment. That is, the righteousness of God will purify everything that is sinful and it can no longer stand in his sight. And it will not be a day that will be a day of rejoicing for everyone. The Bible tells us that unbelievers will go to hell. And there really is such a place called hell. In fact, no one spoke of hell more graphically than the gentle Lord Jesus Christ. He spoke in great detail about it. He said there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping means there will be sadness. Gnashing of teeth means there will be great anger. Jesus said that there will be fire, and the fire is not quenched, and their worm does not die. It will be a place of suffering. Jude explains or describes hell rather as a place of the wandering stars that wander in blackness. It will be a place of great loneliness. And even though there are some who do not want to think about hell because it is too terrible, and by the way, none of us like to think about hell because it is so horrible, there are some who try to deny its existence. There are some who say, well, there is a hell, but you go there only to be burned up and it's temporary punishment, but then, it will, then you will be non-existent and it won't be anymore. The fire of hell, they say, will last forever, but, but not the punishment of hell. And there are all kinds of safety nets that people have created for hell, whether it's purgatory or whether it's the denial of the existence of hell, because how could a loving God send anyone to hell? But the Bible says there is a hell. And it's not a place that we would wish on our worst enemy. It is so horrible. And by the way, it is not a temporary place. The book of Revelation tells us of all who go to hell, he will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever, and there is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast in his image. How horrible. But you know what? That would have been a lot for every one of us. 
because by nature we are dead in sin and the enemies of God. And that is the result of sin. Eternal judgment and punishment in hell. So how can we endure that day, as the prophet Joel says over and over, as Malachi says, who can endure that day? It will be a day of judgment. It will be a day when many people will be lost forever and will see the loving face of God for the last time. And the hell of hells is that they will be banished from his loving presence forever. But there is no need that anyone should have to go to hell. You see, that is the great consolation not only for us today, but for every sinner who has ever walked the face of this earth. No one has to go to hell because our Lord Jesus Christ delivered us from hell. That's why Jesus came into this earth. That's why he is called the Son of Righteousness. You see, that is our great consolation. The day is surely coming, a day of judgment, a day of punishment, but also a day of rejoicing. For the prophet Malachi says, but for you who revere my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And you know what's so great about that? The son of righteousness has already risen. Son, S-O-N. And I'm not just using a tricky play on words. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has risen from death and has proven by his resurrection that everything that he promised is ours. We are certain of our salvation because Jesus has risen. You see, when Jesus came to this earth, Jesus came as the true Son of Righteousness because Jesus lived a perfectly righteous life in our place, the life that we couldn't live. He was tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. And so when Jesus lived a perfect life, that perfect life was imputed to us because Jesus Christ went to the cross for each and every one of us. And when he died there, he paid our debt with his own blood, taking on the sins of every sinner who ever lived or ever shall live. Jesus Christ redeemed us, and the blood of God's Son cleanses us from all sin, the Bible tells us. And now, that perfect righteousness of Jesus, which he lived on this earth, has been imputed to us in exchange for our sin. We are clothed with the righteousness of Jesus, so that when God looks at us, he no longer sees our sin, but the Son of Righteousness has risen with healing in his wings, and he has healed us from all sin. And we can remember how at the baptismal font, Jesus washed away our sin. And the Bible says, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. Through baptism, everything that Jesus did is imparted to us. St. Peter says, baptism now saves you. Not the washing away of dirt from the body, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only way you can have a good conscience before God is if you, your sins are forgiven. And that's what we have, he says, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it proves that everything Jesus did in his perfect life and death are now ours. That is why on the day of judgment, when our Lord Jesus Christ returns, it will not be a day of sadness for us, and it shouldn't be for anyone. Because the message has gone out into all the world and Jesus Christ has died for the sins of every sinner. Malachi describes the dawning of that new day in this way. He says, but for you who revere my name, the Son of Righteousness will rise with healing in its wings and you will go out and leap like calves released from the stall. You know, I grew up in farming territory, although not on a farm, but my uncle owned a dairy farm up in northern Michigan and I Remember how in the spring when he let the calves out for the first time and they discovered their newfound freedom and it was really a hoot. They would just run around and jump and leap and kick and it was just hilarious to watch them realize, wow, what a wonderful world is out here. <laughs> in a much greater way, Malachi says, you're going to be like calves released from the stall. 
you're going to realize the freedom you have in Christ. Freedom from Satan and sin and death. Freedom to serve God. Free from the perils and the curse of sin. And what joy is ours in Jesus as we await that day. And you know what? Eternal life is not something we have to wait for. It's ours here and now. We are reminded that God's promises always come true. And if we look at what is here in our text, we see that this prophecy was already fulfilled in part and we only wait for the rest of it to be fulfilled. The Bible says, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. You know, the Jews have celebrated the Passover for many centuries. In Jesus' day, they would go back to that prophecy that was made by Malachi, where God said, I will send the prophet Elijah before that great and dreadful day of the Lord. And even to this day, when Jews celebrate the Passover and have the Seder meal, they have a place setting with a chair, an empty chair, for a guest. No one sits there. They even pour a glass of wine and put it there, waiting for a guest. You know who that guest is? It's supposed to be the prophet Elijah because they believe that the prophet Elijah has to come back and when he does, he will also usher in the day when the Messiah will come. And so they have a person who is designated right during the meal to get up and go to the door and open the door and see if Elijah is there. But he will never be there. And that place setting will always be empty and the chair will be empty and the wine will never be drunk. Because Jesus said this prophecy is already fulfilled. His apostles asked him about it. They said, why did the teachers of the law say that Elijah must first come? And Jesus replied, to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking about John the Baptist. They suddenly got it. Of course, the Holy Spirit directed them and reminded them of a few things. In particular, the words that the angel Gabriel had told Zechariah, the father of John the baptizer, before he was born. He said, your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Then he went on to say, Many of the people of Israel will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Yes, the disciples of Jesus got it, and we do too. Elijah has come. He came as John the baptizer, who was really the last prophet of the Old Testament, even after Malachi, because John the baptizer came before the birth of Christ and crossed over into the pages of the Bible, into the New Testament, to proclaim Jesus is here. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as it was promised by Malachi and by the angel Gabriel, he would turn the hearts of many back to the Lord. And that is what he did. And we thank God that that gospel was proclaimed. God said, remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. In other words, remember everything that was written in the Bible? Well, all of those promises are yours. Yours and mine, and they belong to every sinner who will hear and take to heart what they say and believe on them and know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. For the Bible reminds us that the Son of Righteousness will come with healing in his wings. And we await that day. There are anxious times when we who are still living in this sinful world, surrounded by the darkness of sin, still pray that prayer. We pray for daylight. We say, even so, come Lord Jesus. And we understand 
what the psalmist meant in Psalm 130 when he said, My soul waits for the Lord. More than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning, he repeats. Oh, how the morning would come. How Jesus Christ would return and that he would grant us all of the blessings that he promises. Well, that day is coming. Surely the day is coming, a day of fiery judgment, but also a day of rejoicing for those of us who believe. Let us pray that God would hasten that day. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen.